again, thank you for coming. So I'm Philip Imholt, and um, since I have the television, I, I might as well clarify. So there's like four, at least four versions of my name around town, but uh, I grew up and it was Imholt, so we'll stick with that. Um, and um, so uh, I guess a little bit about myself. I grew up in Detroit Lakes. I went to uh, University of Minnesota, Minneapolis for medical school, and then I went to uh, Duluth for residency after uh, residency in Duluth. I worked in uh, some ERs for a little bit and then moved here with my wife. Um, we have a three-year-old son and a dog and we like exercise and we, we might see us out walking around town a lot. So um, anyways, so my topic was um, ways to um, first off stay out of the doctor's office and then uh, save money and secondly uh, prevent the spread of germs. So it, it's something where I keep feeling like the, the topics that I picked are things that I tell people over over again. So it seemed like a good way to just uh, get it out there in a, in a talk. And um, I also think it's sort of interesting to see who comes through and, and our poor receptionist, um, people come to the window and then they're sick and they're coughing all over her and she doesn't really have uh, any line of defense. So um, we'll have a little bit of talk about uh, germ uh, transmission and prevention. Uh, and then the other thing that I thought was kind of pertinent was we do get a fair number of people in who say, well, I'm not sure, am I, am I contagious or am I, uh, should I go visit my relative with cancer or something like that? Um, but they've come into the office and coughed on things and spread germs and then someone with cancer actually comes to our office. So I'm kind of hoping that I would um, uh, keep people out that don't need to come in necessarily and um, I'm sure all of you fine folk would not do that, but maybe someone watching on television will get the message. So um, anyways, uh, basically, like I said, I ran through the objectives. There are some things that we can do to try to keep from coming in and then times at which you should be seen. As far as things to prevent from getting uh, sick, just in general, uh, with all illnesses, I mean, rest is proven, hydration is proven like a baseline general health, uh, so if you're exercising regularly, that uh, will prevent you from being ill as much, and then uh, preventing the spread of disease. So I think there's only a couple pictures that aren't kind of disgusting, so I'll give you a little bit of warning, but we want people to cover up uh, their cough or sneeze, so um, if you cough, you're supposed to cough into a, a tissue and then throw the tissue away and wash your hands. If, uh, if I was standing here and I had nothing better to do, uh, I should at least cover my mouth uh, and cough into my sleeve. And uh, at least I'm not coughing and, and coughing and sending it out into the air and hitting the people in the back row or something like that. So then I, we know um, hand washing is important. I think it's really clear that Children are good disease vectors because they walk around with snotty noses and wipe their arms and their sleeves and don't really wash their hands. But I think it's pretty sad that adults don't either. Um, so this picture uh, it, I took from an internet site and basically this woman washed her hands and then held, they held up a UV light to see how well she did and then washed longer with soap and then uh, did the optimal which is washing with soap and washing her hands for 20 seconds and then drying them. Uh, and so even when she washed with soap, there's still plenty of germs left uh, to be spread. I, I think it, it's kind of interesting that when they've done observational studies, people say, oh, you came out of the bathroom, did you wash your hands? Yep, but when they've had monitors testing that theory, it's not true. Um, so, and, and a lot of times we're not using soap even when we're washing. So. Anyways, that's why we give out hand sanitizer. It's uh, not as good as washing your hands with soap and water, but it's still better than nothing. Um, so kind of some more statistics. So they, they actually did a, uh, the Minnesota Department of Health did a study at the State Fair. So I would definitely bring the hand sanitizer if you go to the State Fair. Um, and then another big thing was um, that if you just washed your hands and walk around, uh, I mean, the, the reason we have viruses and bacteria that transmit is we have moist surfaces on our body. So if you have dry hands, you're less likely to transmit or pick up something uh, if they're dry than if they're wet. So uh, drying was actually important as well. Okay, so I got a, a number of different conditions. So uh, pink eye or conjunctivitis is um, 
the name that the medical name for it. So basically, I guess we see a fair amount of this. People are thinking that they need some kind of treatment, but most of the time it's viral. We can't treat a virus. It's just going to run its course. Even if you have a bacterial eye infection, a lot of those will run their course as well. And so there's only certain ones that we really need to treat, and I'm going to go over that a little bit and show you a picture. So basically, uh, it tends to last a few days, but sometimes it'll last a couple weeks. Most of the time, it's not a severe case lasting a couple weeks. It's more of a, a mild irritation. And most of the time, uh, bacterial will be more likely to stay on one side, and a viral one will more commonly spread to the other side. A lot of the viral ones come with colds, so uh, someone could have a sore throat and a runny nose, or even uh, stomach upset or diarrhea, and end up with pink eye. Uh, whereas bacterial tends to be more uh, just a pink eye. And um, if the eyelid swells a lot or there's a lot of eye drainage, then that's something of concern. Uh, as far as treatment, again, hand washing, but actually this is uh, important also to the person that's ill. So if you have it in your right eye and you don't want it to go to your left eye, you don't want to touch your right eye and then touch your left eye. You want to wash your hands. Uh, most of the viruses uh, can survive on countertops. Uh, some of the ones that cause pink eye are good at even uh, staying on hand towels. So uh, just washing, being careful, otherwise you will uh, spread it to the other side. Uh, as far as over the counter treatments, just some saline drops uh, or Visine, uh, and some of the brands will say you can get the red out, uh, and that'll reduce the irritation. Uh, and contact wearers should remove their contacts. In the viral version, the discharge tends to be more watery. Both will end up with uh, mattering in the eye. So if you wake up and the eye is stuck shut and you get rid of it and you're OK the rest of the day, it's irritated and it has more of a watery drainage, it's probably viral. If you wake up and you get rid of this gunk in your eye and then 15 minutes later there's more gunk and 15 minutes later there's more gunk and it keeps coming out, that's more likely bacterial. Uh, and then you can also have uh, allergic uh, conjunctivitis, and that can be from pollen in the air or other irritants like that. So uh, so anyways, so one of the big differences, and I, like people will come in and they'll say, oh, my, I have this bad pink eye, and it, they look like that. And I say, well, yes, it's annoying, and your eye's pink, and it's red, and it's irritated. But when the eyelid's swollen, and it's got this icky-looking discharge that comes out again and again and again, that's the stuff that's bad that we would treat. OK, <laughs> so we'll move on. So the kind of the biggest topic uh, that I could come up with as far as areas of research was the common cold. And that is because of the frequency of illness. So children, in general, average about uh, six cases a year, and adults three. A lot of the times, they're mild in severity or sometimes even barely noticeable. We'll swab people and figure out they're carrying a virus, and they didn't really even have much for symptoms or had a couple bad days of scratchy throat, something like that. Um, certainly. Uh, Colds are more common in children in daycare. Uh, so one of the conferences I went to showed a slide, and there was this huge rate of uh, colds. And then once children got exposed to a lot, they kind of leveled out. And other kids, they just kind of kept a steady track towards um, uh, when they go to school. And then they had a spike because they've been exposed to a lot of people. So uh, it does help to get some exposure and build immunity over time. But there's so many different types. and things can change, so that's why people tend to keep getting ill. That's also why there's no vaccines, because of there's so many viruses. So we can't just say, here, we've invented this, we'll inject it in you, you'll become immune to it, you won't get it again, because there's too many kinds to work with. Um, and so we'll go over the vaccination with uh, influenza in a little bit, uh, as far as how it's made and even why the vaccine wouldn't work for the common cold. So. Uh, most people know the symptoms, so you have runny nose, sneezing, um, sore throat, sometimes cough. People feel run down. Usually it's a, a temperature of like 99 or 100, not 102 or 103, something that's a lot higher. Another thing that usually comes out is so people come in and they lost their voice, and then there's not much we can do about that either. So that's kind of a common thing. You know, they'll, they'll have trouble talking, and they'll say, Oh, you have laryngitis, that's usually viral. Sometimes it's just irritation from coughing uh, or voice strain, but there's not much we can do about that uh, as far as a, a treatment. And so a lot of times, the, uh, like I said, it's going to run its course. It's kind of around a week on average. Uh, things can certainly last longer. I mean, people can be sick two, three weeks. And um, it doesn't mean that antibiotics are needed. Personally, I've, I think I actually got two things 
since I have a son and he likes to spread germs, but I mean, I, I was sick for seven weeks last year and even had a couple doctors off from the antibiotics, but it went away. I mean, I just was sick a long time and I was up a lot at night and not getting proper rest and that's why I point up the rest and stay hydrated and take care of yourself. Um, so as far as the biggest reason for being seen, uh, the common cold is a very uh, common reason for asthma flares. So if someone has asthma and then they're having difficulty breathing or COPD and difficulty breathing, that would be a reason to come in. Uh, and then sometimes colds will turn into ear infections. Uh, so we'll tend to treat those with uh, antibiotics or sinus infections, and I'll go over the sinus infections. Um, and I guess just a quick thing, since I mentioned ear infections, uh, people will get uh, plugged up uh, inside their their ear pressurized or pressure equalizes with the eustachian tube and that'll get plugged up so if you're having a hard time hearing especially on both sides it's probably not an ear infection it's probably that but if one side got really painful or a new fever came on that would be something to be seen for um, so there's been a lot of research on colds because they're so common uh, people get so many and uh, so we can make a lot of money on treating them uh, either because your product works or because you market it well. So uh, there are a few things that might help and part of the problem is a lot of the research, if something shows it might work, there's probably another study that shows it doesn't or that there might be a small study that showed something and a larger study that showed it didn't work as well. Also, some of these things listed, uh, they were shown uh, to work in another country and we don't have that version available in the United States. So uh, just because something worked doesn't mean that we're gonna get the same. And then I can't tell you it definitely helps, but certainly I would say some of the things listed are safer than what we have over the counter and that some of the stuff over the counter has no good evidence either. It just was marketed and it's available and so people buy it and it's a big industry so they can make a lot of money. So as far as uh, things that might help, uh, zinc uh, actually has a decent amount of proof. Um, it, the, in the studies where it worked, it sounds like the dose that worked best was 75 milligrams, but it was taken every uh, few hours. So even uh, a lot of the studies were every two hours. And I don't know, I didn't read through to see what they did at night, but I, I imagine it was only in the day, but it's still pretty, I, I think, kind of an annoying treatment if you have to remember to keep taking it. Um, but that, that actually would be something worthwhile. So it actually um, showed about a one and a half days less of illness. So out of a week, I thought that was rather meaningful. And then um, about half the people that were taking zinc didn't have their cold symptoms anymore at a week uh, uh, as those that did not take it. So it actually sh did show some difference in the studies that showed a benefit uh, versus, like I said, some that we could say didn't. Um, all right, then this uh, next one is called Andrographis paniculata. And the reason I was so excited to put it in there is that there's actually a brand called Calm Cold, and that's in the handout. They actually did a study with their exact version that had better results than this uh, herbal medication. However, I started looking more after we got all our handout stuff. I can't buy it, I can't buy it online, I can't buy it on Amazon, I can't buy it at Target, I mean, so I don't think it's actually available in the United States. It was intended to be marketed, and that in the journal that I read it in, uh, it was a family physician journal, and they actually mentioned it by name because it was effective, however, it's not available. So you can, you can buy the herbal version, that would be about three to 400 milligrams three times a day. Um, so then the next one, uh, that's actually is available in stores, I don't know if I dare say the name, but the Prelagonium sidoides, or sidoides, uh, it's a geranium extract. And there's a study showing uh, the actual extract being used, and then there's a homeopathic version, and that's the Umca cold care. And so you would just take the directions on the package, which I think is 10 drops a few times a day, uh, if I remember correctly. The, both of those seemed pretty safe. They didn't have a lot of side effects, and they said there was reduction in symptoms. So I would say when generally with the reduction in symptoms is the same as saying, I'm going to take a cough medicine or a cold medicine. I can't tell you exactly. I liked the ones like zinc where it said, here's how many days less you should be sick and how much better you should be, that sort of thing. 
uh, but again, they're very safe. So the other thing that uh, has been proven that's more of, we'll say, a traditional uh, medicine would be decongestant. So that would be pseudoephedrine specifically, or Sudafed. Now, pseudoephedrine was used to make methamphetamine, so it's restricted, and you have to ask the pharmacist for it. And they'll give you a box, and they'll take your driver's license and scan it. And presumably, if you buy hundreds of boxes, then someone might come looking for you. Um, but uh, the stuff on the c over the counter or that you can buy off the shelf is uh, phenylephrine, and that is at least less effective, if not I completely ineffective. So, if I was going to buy a decongestant, I would just buy pseudoephedrine and not waste my time with the other stuff that's in all the things you can buy off the shelf. The warning, I guess I would say, is it can cause high blood pressure. Um, it is something that uh, gives you adrenaline-type hormones, and a lot of people are on blood pressure medicines that block those hormones, and so uh, then I would not utilize it. Um, so my advice is in general and doesn't necessarily apply if there are certain conditions where you should avoid it. Now, decongestants with an antihistamine also showed some benefit, but antihistamines alone did not. So going to take Benadryl or Claritin or Zyrtec or Allegra, that did not really help. It just tended to make mucus thicker. Uh, so people actually, some got worse uh, when it was studied. Uh, there's ipratropium in a nasal spray and an inhaler, and those would be prescription things. But I guess if someone was having a terrible cough or terrible runny nose and said, I really want something to make it better, uh, that's something available by prescription. And then um, as far as like sore throat or uh, body aches and pains, headache, things like that, I guess I would favor naproxen over ibuprofen. So there's been some studies showing anti-inflammatory or NSAIDs uh, can interfere with aspirin and might be a cardiovascular risk, and naproxen appears safer than ibuprofen. Uh, so naproxen an anti-inflammatory? Naproxen is an anti-inflammatory. It's a leave is the brand name. Oh. Um, but generic works just as well, I would say. Uh, some people might argue about that, but um, I, I would say most people, if you go get something, you can buy the generic since it's cheaper. It's common to say you could take two of the naproxen pills twice a day, uh, which is close to a prescription strength uh, versus one of them, which is a little lo lower dose. And then uh, dextromethorphan and guifenesin, they're uh, the common ingredients in Robitussin or other cough medications. And so there actually have been a number of studies with that, but they're all mixed results. So I could actually say that there's some better proof for certain herbal things than there are for our commercial cough medications. Um, then as far as things that don't help, uh, I mentioned the antihistamines. So echinacea, uh, there are an equal number of studies saying it works as those saying that it does not work. Uh, it does not uh, appear to really be very effective unless you, there was a couple certain extracts and they were more common in other countries. So I can't say that what we can get uh, avail or commercially available in the United States is going to work. Um, and then the other caution would be depending on the uh, supplier. The other thing that's been worrisome is speci specifically Ayurvedic medicines or uh, things from India or China. Uh, there was concerns about lead or heavy metal contaminants in certain uh, products. So that would just be something to uh, be a caution, especially for the, the two herbal things, uh, depending on where you're getting the supply from. Uh, vitamin C, I'll get to in the next slide, which is on prevention, but it doesn't seem to help. So if you get sick and you start taking a bunch of vitamin C, that didn't really show uh, to be effective in studies. Uh, nasal steroids, uh, just for kind of run-of-the-mill colds, so those are the like flonase and nasocort, they didn't really seem to help, but they do seem to help sinus infections. And then uh, I really like neti pots, but I guess in most studies with the common cold, if it's kind of like a thinner sneezing, watery, blowing your nose a lot, that didn't really seem to help too much. And then, uh, so zinc orally uh, has some great proof. Actually, zinc in a nasal spray, I also think was found to be effective, but it, it caused people to lose their sense of smell. Uh, so products were removed from the shelves in the United States, and um, there's kind of the uh, standard uh, medicine, and then there's kind of company alternative medicine. And all the authors of the things I looked at said, don't even use the homeopathic uh, zinc sprays because we couldn't say it was safe. So basically, don't spray anything with zinc in your nose. Um, Would that be permanent loss? Yes, Ooh. permanent uh, loss of smell. Oh, wow. 
uh, antibiotics have not been shown to be effective for the cold. Uh, now, if there was some complication of it, such as an ear infection, then yes, or uh, certain other situations like a flare-up of uh, COPD or emphysema. Uh, but in general, that's why we don't treat, and that's why I'm saying you could try some other things that are safe and not harmful and, and not necessarily have to come in. Uh, and then codeine cough syrup actually showed harm in studies, but some people love it, so I have to say I've prescribed it because uh, the other thing, which maybe I'll mention when uh, it, we'll get to the prevention part, but uh, placebo results, I mean, 10 to 30 percent in studies. So if somebody says codeine works for me, maybe it does, maybe they just think it does, but it makes them better. So actually it does work for them. Uh, so the, the um, alternative medicine person that I was reading said, sure, if people say, I think Robitussin really helps me or I want to take um, phenylephrine over the counter and they say it works, by all means, take it if it's safe, it hasn't caused problems, because if they think it works, it'll probably make you better faster. So um, there, there may be something to that. So I guess my main point is, I don't want you to take things that would make you worse, and um, I also don't want you to waste a bunch of money. So um, as far as prevention, now zinc worked if you get sick, but it didn't work if you take it all the time to prevent getting sick. Uh, garlic, and it specifically the allicin, or it's an extract of garlic, the dose it should be 180 milligrams daily. That actually showed some prevention of illness, so there was a lower likelihood that people would get sick during uh, cold and flu season. And I, I believe it was something like uh, there might have even been half as many colds in the study, but the study wasn't great, so I don't think it's harmful. In fact, if you just said, I want to eat more garlic, that's healthy for you, so by all means. Uh, vitamin C. Uh, taking two to 500 milligrams a day uh, had about an 8% reduction in cold. So it does help. <coughs> you have to take it every day. It's not real harmful. Uh, so if that was something you want to do, I think that would be perfectly reasonable. Now vitamin D, vitamin E, uh, echinacea, none of those really showed to have benefit in studies uh, as far as prevention. And then ginseng, it didn't really get any mention um, except for one source, but that said, well, it might help. There can actually be some harm from echinacea and uh, ginseng, so I guess I wasn't a big fan or I wasn't tending to recommend them. Uh, so probiotics also have uh, shown to have some great benefit. Uh, there was a 50% reduction in colds, and so that means in theory you would get half as many. So if you go with the average, now you're going to get one and a half colds instead of three. I don't know if it's worth taking a, a pill every day for that, but uh, there was some good benefit. And if you could do get sick, it was a couple days less illness, so five instead of seven days on average. Uh, and so there, this uh, lactobacillus and bifidobacterium are the two in the studies. It was five to 10 billion uh, colony forming units a day, so these little bacterial colonies grow out, and that's the measurement. There's a number of different probiotics. They all have a lot of different ingredients. There are certain brands that meet these criteria, and the ones that I could find uh, from a, a website called Consumer Lab that tests things to make sure that if it says there's 10 billion colony form units, that they're actually there. And yogurt doesn't have uh, enough probiotic. Um, so, and if you look at the cost, uh, if you were to buy yogurt or probiotic, I mean, a lot of probiotics are 20 bucks for 30 pills, so it's a dollar a pill, and you're, it's a dollar a yogurt, I mean, you're better off getting a pill. Um, there's not sugar in it, so it's not going to have an absorption issue if you have diarrhea and shoot through you, which we'll get to. So uh, I'm a big fan of probiotics. And, and uh, the other thing I would say is I think I've seen more benefit with any kind than to say it was to the specific condition. So uh, when we get to the diarrhea part, I mean, I think just in general they work, but as far as cold prevention, this is the stuff that was proven. Uh, so exercise, moderate exercise, reduced infections, which I pointed out in the beginning. So there was a study in Wisconsin, <coughs> so it had about 30 to 40 percent reduction in a number of colds and other illnesses that people had. Uh, so it, intense exercise, like marathons and other things where people get very stressed, uh, there, there's actually a higher rate of infection, as you imagine, if you're stressing your body out a lot. But if you're kind of staying active and healthy every day, that's protective and beneficial, um, better than sitting on the couch. And um, meditation, uh, this was kind of maybe along the, the lines of the, I don't, I don't want to say it's placebo, but just 
if, if your mind is right and you think uh, healthy thoughts and are calm and low in stress, uh, there was a uh, uh, 40 to 50 percent reduction in the number of colds uh, and illnesses in this study in Wisconsin. Um, so that could be a benefit. And then I almost put a picture of the people wearing the face masks to, so they don't get the Middle, uh, Middle East flu or the uh, SIRS or whatever else. So all those people walking around with masks, there was no difference uh, in the number of illnesses, people wearing that versus the ones that just said, I'm going to take my chances. OK. And then for children, um, so honey has a lot of proof. Uh, and I actually, I'm not sure about in adults, but uh, in studies it went up to age 18 and uh, there was still benefit. So it's about a teaspoon of honey to uh, prevent uh, or treat cough in children. And uh, in general, uh, children had like less cough, they slept better and parents slept better because they got to do something and help their child and, the, and didn't worry as much about their coughing at night. Uh, then this, the UMCA cold care showed some benefit. So vapor rub, or specifically people think of Vicks vapor rub, that actually helps with some symptoms as far as breathing, congestion, uh, as long as the child will tolerate the burning kind of sensation that sometimes occurs. Uh, and then zinc actually m can be helpful both possibly from a treatment or from a prevention standpoint. However, uh, there is concern about uh, copper absorption and other mineral absorption. So. In general, I guess I would shy away from saying give my kid uh, zinc every day to treat a cold. Um, so it seems a lot safer in adults. And so most of the things for adults, they're safe in, in adults of people of general uh, good health. Uh, and most of the things that were advised to use said don't use in children and don't use in pregnant women just because of the concern about contaminants and things like that. Uh, and so a lot of things that don't help, so over-the-counter cough medicine, there's actually, uh, depending on what's in it, so between Benadryl and dextromethorphan, there was actually overdose deaths in young children, so uh, there's been a blanket withdrawal, so don't use them in, uh, in children under two, and, and then uh, specifically with caution in ages two to six, um, and there was no proof, there was no studies on children, these things were out there, people could buy them and use them, and, and companies made money and um, people got hurt. So uh, honey is a lot safer. All the other things, so echinacea didn't really show benefit. Antihistamines, that's just a danger. Uh, inhalers will utilize, but it should be specifically for wheezing. Otherwise, it can just make children jittery. Uh, and then vitamin C didn't really seem to show much benefit. It did in adults, but not in children. Uh, vaporizers, humidifiers, things like that. So there wasn't a lot of great proof. Um, it seems that the theory would be that it will thin secretions. and maybe help a little bit, but it didn't say that uh, kids can be sick a lesser amount of time or something like that. I haven't seen any studies that said like, oh, did they uh, have to miss school or daycare or something because they couldn't breathe well enough for their coughing a whole bunch and now they slept better and everything's getting better. But I, I'd still advise it just because it seems like it does help, but I didn't see a lot of good evidence on vapor, uh, vaporizers, humidifiers, things like that. Yep, so, d so dry air will definitely uh, cause sore throat and people that have nosebleeds, things like that. Uh, so I, I think y you just look at the harm. I mean, it's pretty low harm and it can help. So that's why I say to, to use uh, vaporizers. Okay, so influenza, there's uh, two uh, types of influenza. There's influenza A and influenza B. Um, there's uh, a number of mutations each year. So that um, that's why we have to reformulate the uh, influenza vaccine uh, to try to match the uh, virus each year. Um, we can do swabs for influenza. So unlike, I mean, I guess I can swab you and say you might have this kind of cold virus, but when we're looking for influenza, we're at least looking at two different kinds, so it's a lot easier to test. So um, you can have a lot of the same overlap in symptoms, so there'll be fevers, chills, um, cough, muscle aches, headache, nasal congestion, um, sore throat fa fatigue in influenza, a lot of overlap to colds. The uh, main thing is if they're sneezing, it's not likely to be influenza. Uh, if there's a higher fever, it's more likely to be uh, influenza. And uh, if there's body aches, then it's more likely to be influenza and not a cold. So when we have a worse flu season, it's usually when there's been some big mutation or drift um, from the previous year. 
So if we get exposed or enough people get exposed, they have some immunity, they, we cut down on uh, flu transmission, and then if a different type comes out, then it kind of goes wild and spreads around a lot. Uh, so same thing, it's transmitted by cough, contaminated surfaces. So I will at least put up the, the best positive results on the flu shot. Uh, if you get a single flu shot, we can't, I can't say that it saves anyone's life per se, but there's been some studies where getting a flu shot every year for enough years, and I think it was like three, um, beyond that time, you c there's actually a, a lower rate of death, so 40% uh, reduction. Uh, it was actually higher in younger age groups um, because they hadn't been around to be exposed to as much uh, flu seasons. Um, and you'd imagine not that many young people will die from flu. It's a lot of times people that are older. Uh, so there was a not that many people, but a big reduction versus at over age 65, there's a 24% reduction. Uh, but that saved a lot more lives than in the younger age groups. Um, and then in age 40 plus, there was 20% uh, less heart attack. Uh, so if you get sick, it strains your heart, you have a heart attack, that's kind of the idea there. Um, so I guess the main thing is I, I say do flu shot and do it every year. Um, the other thing is people say, well, it's not effective. Well, it depends on what study you quote. So the reason people say it's not effective is if you, if you swab against influenza and say you have influenza, did the flu shot work? It's about 60% effective in general. If you just say, well, it seems like you have the flu, maybe you have parainfluenza, maybe you have one of those 200 viruses like the cold and we just think you have a flu-like illness, then it's only 16% effective, which to me makes sense because you're getting a shot against the flu, you're not getting a shot against something like the flu. Um, so there's also a little bit of debate, but in um, a number of studies, it did show a reduction in the amount of uh, symptoms and hospitalizations that people had. So between 60 and 90% um, <coughs> improvement or reduction in hospitalizations and, and severe symptoms. Uh, and then a just quick thing on the different types. So there's more than what I listed, but there's trivalent, so there's three uh, strains in it, and there's two A strains and one B. And then there's high dose trivalent uh, that's recommended for age 65 plus because it gives a better immune boost. Now it can also give more kind of aches or side effects, but nothing severe. And then there's a quadrivalent, so that's the typical one that we've been giving out for a couple years. So there's two A strains and two B strains, so you get a little better and broader coverage. Uh, and then the nasal spray also covers four kinds. Uh, there's egg-free kind, but actually egg allergy is not a reason to not have the flu shot. There's no uh, higher rate of anaphylaxis or hives or other things with flu shots. Um, and uh, we think it will last about four to six months, so the one thing was don't get your shot too early, but in general, I mean, if we do them in October, it should last the average flu season. And um, the other big question that I've been getting is, well, should I stop my cholesterol medicine because I'm on Lipitor or Zocor or uh, another statin? Uh, because it makes the flu shot ineffective because that was popular this fall. So it was about 18% thought to be less effective and it was against uh, respiratory illness. So it wasn't against flu, just in general it was against something like the flu, like I had just mentioned. And actually people on statins, it seemed like they, in, when people are asked to recall, they recalled getting sick more than people that didn't take it. And so the one thought there is, are people that are taking the cholesterol medicines just have more health problems and uh, those that didn't were healthier in general. So uh, the, the main thing was, I would still get a flu shot even if you're on a cholesterol medicine. I don't think I would stop the cholesterol medicine at this point. We don't really know. It's just one little study that became very popular in the uh, media. Okay, and then uh, people coming in to get medication. So. Uh, Tamiflu and Relenza, it's an inhaled version. They actually do help. They prevent um, getting it if you take it when you're healthy and someone around you has it. Uh, they reduce the transmission and they'll make people have a shorter duration of uh, flu from seven days to 6.3 days on average. So the, the big concern I have about that is it doesn't treat other uh, things that are like influenza. So if we don't know and we treat, uh, then it might not help. And um, they're actually, it's the same as antibiotics. We're concerned that the uh, influenza will become resistant and then in the future we won't have anything to treat uh, people that really need it. So it's recommended uh, within uh, 48 hours of becoming ill 
And then it's recommended for people that have uh, asthma, breathing problems, are severely sick uh, with um, high fever, and they're low on oxygen, and they need to be in the hospital. So we're using in those cases a lot. Uh, children under 2, over 65, low immunity, or pregnant women. Uh, so it's not recommended for someone who's healthy. So uh, I guess I would actually qualify to get it because I'm a healthcare worker, but otherwise, if I wasn't, I shouldn't take it. Um, okay, sinus infections. So about 90% of the time, they're viral. Um, the longer they stick around, the more likely they're to be uh, bacterial. So at 10 days, it's about half and half. And that's kind of our branch point for cutoff. So if somebody came in and they said, I have a uh, sinus pressure and I think I have a sinus infection, I've had it for three days, then I would say we should do the treatments I'm going to outline. If they say, I've had it for two weeks and I just started getting uh, sweats and I think I have a fever and it really hurts right here and my teeth hurt, uh, then uh, that would be a reason to think that they had a virus to start with, a bacteria got stuck in there, uh, just like with ear infections, and then it got much worse, and that I can treat with antibiotic, but the other stuff I can't, uh, if, they're, if you're getting worse uh, overall or not getting better by 10 days. So on the sinuses, there, these are the maxillary, these are the frontal sinuses, there's ethmoid that are back down the middle, so people will say, you know, it hurts up here, that's a sinus headache, that's what they're talking about. Those are, those are supposed to be air spaces. If they get fluid in them, you get uncomfortable. If that fluid gets infected, then it becomes a lot more uncomfortable. Okay, so things that we can use to treat. So nasal steroids uh, are Flonase and Nasacort are both over the counter. So that was kind of the thing that almost prompted me to start the talk because I kept telling people, because now these two things are over the counter and they used to not be. So it used to be a prescription and now you can go pick it up. Uh, they're both about 20 bucks, and it's pretty <coughs> comparable on most insurances. So, um, you know, if if you go in, it might cost the same amount to have a prescription, or sometimes more to have a prescription, believe it or not, than to just go buy it off the counter or over the counter. Uh, so, anyways, they're both two sprays, uh, and it would be once a day, and they reduce inflammation in the uh, nose. So, there's little holes from the sinus to the nose, and if that gets plugged up with snot. You're going to get all this fluid in there, it's going to hurt. And if you can keep the inflammation down, then you can blow your nose a lot and get the junk out. Uh, that's kind of how the neti pot works, or this um, bottle, the, the sinus rinse bottle. And from what I've seen, the neti pot's about 15 bucks, and the, the bottle's about 5 bucks. They both, you put saline in them. Uh, the other thing is there's little saline bottles. They just do a mist in the air, like you could squeeze it and it would mist up. That was maybe a little helpful, but nothing uh, like as helpful as the uh, saline irrigation, meaning the bottle or the neti pot. So you make up a salt solution, and um, you can also buy packets to go with these things. And basically, you do like this guy. So you have the solution. You lean over, you hold it up, and it's going to run up your nose, and it's going to maybe feel like you're going underwater or got water up your nose in the pool or something. and then. Uh, come out the other side, and you do that for about half the way. Blow your nose, get everything out, go back the other way, and get all the bad stuff out. You can do it multiple times a day. Uh, ideally, you would do it with sterilized water so that you, uh, there's some rare chances where something comes out of the faucet that's not so good. Um, the other things that can help are decongestants. So again, that would be pseudoephedrine that has proof of effect. Or, uh, uh, the nasal spray versions, which would be Afrin or phenylephrine spray. And the, the spray should only be used for about three days. If you stop using them, everything swells up, and then you're actually worse off. So you could use the sprays uh, to open everything up and get everything to drain for a few days. And then a lot of times, people will notice if they use the spray and then they use the neti pot, it kind of flows through there a little better. If you were to use the neti pot to get all the gross stuff out, then you could use the Flonase because it'll actually have something to stick to and it won't just stick to snot. So that's kind of the general way to go. All right, as far as antibiotics, they have some mixed benefit. It's definitely more effective when uh, the conditions that I explained in the previous slide are present. And then just sort of the interesting thing, we, ha we have this thing called number needed to treat. So everybody thinks, I need antibiotics, I'm going to get better because I have antibiotics. But 
70% of people without antibiotics got better versus 80% with antibiotics after a couple weeks. So most people actually get better. Antibiotics definitely save lives, but they also don't always do what we want, or people will get better without them. So the, the treatment numbers of benefit are the same for antibiotics as for using the nasal, nasal steroid. So about 15 people have to use them to get better. And um, again, you can go buy over-the-counter one thing, and it doesn't have a possible resistance, whereas the other does. So I would recommend trying the nasal steroid. All right, uh, sore throat. Uh, the other thing we get a lot is people wondering if they have strep. Well, st a lot of sore throats are viral. They're not always strep. Uh, strep tends to last uh, three and a half days on average, and then it can go away. So it's just self-limited. It's nothing that has to be treated uh, unless you're a child, as I'll go through below. So if you have a fever, you don't have a cough, you have uh, white junk on your tonsils or the back of the throat and swollen glands, it's more likely that there's uh, strep. It's also a lot more common in children than adults. Uh, if we use antibiotics, it actually makes uh, people better about a half day on average, so three days versus three and a half days. The main reason we want to use it is to prevent rheumatic fever, and that's highest in ages 5 to 15. And just interestingly, it's very uncommon in the developed world to have that, so we actually have to treat three to 4,000 people to prevent a case. So that's the reason for it, and, and um, I guess I would definitely say if there's peak incidence and we can prevent it in a child, that makes some sense, and if they get better, uh, there's benefit as well. But uh, in adults, there's actually, I've seen a number of infectious disease doctor articles about saying, well, should we even recommend that adults be treated? Uh, because it's very unlikely to get rheumatic fever and also not as common to have strep when you're older. And then people always think like, oh, if someone has it, I'm going to get it. But it's about 35% is the transmission rate. So uh, for whatever that's worth. Uh, so diarrhea and vomiting. So basically. People say stomach flu. Well, stomach flu is not the flu. It's not influenza. They're completely different things. Gastroenteritis is the name we would use. The other thing is sometimes it's food poisoning, but it, I mean, it, we can sort of say it's the, either way, it could be a virus or it could be bacterial. So a lot of the bacterial ones are things that people are aware of, like salmonella and other things, campylobacter. So that's where you want to cook your meat properly wash off surfaces when you're cleaning food. If you leave out something like mayonnaise or potato salad or whatever in the hot sun for hours and hours, you can get uh, staph that forms and will make people sick hours later, that sort of thing. But otherwise, most of the time it's viral uh, and it could go with other things. So you could have a sore throat and runny nose and uh, diarrhea and other things, or it could just be your upset stomach and loose stools or vomiting and no loose stools, all sorts of different combinations. So sometimes it's a maybe a really bad case and it lasts a day and it's gone. Other things are uh, kind of touchy stomach for a week, something like that. Basically, uh, the, the most common transmission, apart from, we'll say, food poisoning, is fecal oral. So this is with the whole wash your hands thing and uh, use your hand sanitizer maybe, and hopefully whoever is making your food is doing the same things. Um, but that's how we get these big outbreaks. And uh, certain times it's because someone at a restaurant wasn't being clean, uh, clean enough, but other times it's because the food came contaminated with something. All right, so reasons why people should come in. So if, if it was like two days of fever, that's fine, but I would say five days of fever with diarrhea, I mean, something else is going on. So you kind of have to use some judgment. Where do you decide that it, you're, it's a concerning thing and you should be seen? Uh, people if you, that get dehydrated. So first off, you, you're, it's going to be hard to recover from it if you're dehydrated. And usually it's going to be inability to take any fluid in, uh, whether it's uh, just not even able to take something because they feel like they're going to throw up, or be, if you're actually vomiting and have diarrhea, then it's doubly worse. Uh, so it usually takes about a day. So a lot of times we'll get people in that are worried because they've had it for a few hours or something. But I mean, most of the time it's going to take a day. So if, if you kind of just lay low and then can bounce back the next day, it's usually safe to stay at home and treat yourself that way. Um, and then the, the other thing is just trying to distinguish between something concerning like an uh, appendicitis uh, or diverticulitis. So if, if it's just really bad, like I can't move around, um, it hurts down on the right side, that would be the appendicitis. And if it was on the left side, uh, that's going to be more common in adults. So that would be diverticulitis or colitis. 
And so that could have fever, that could have just consistent pain, uh, similar symptoms. And then bloody diarrhea, a lot of times that's something more severe, so usually we'll look into that with stool tests, uh, possibly do some kind of treatment, sometimes antibiotics. Uh, some bacteria actually, they get very angry with ever being killed off by antibiotics and they release even more toxins and make people worse. So some things even that we know, uh, if something's present, like a salmonella, we would just say, sorry, we're gonna let it be um, and it'll go away on its own generally. So if there's bloody stool, diarrhea for over a week, someone has a poor immune system because the medications are on, or if you came in and you got antibiotics for your sinus infection and then uh, a month later you started having diarrhea and you had a high fever and things aren't going well, then I'd be concerned that you got C. diff or Clostridium difficile. So that's been a common occurrence now and it's uh, pretty much because we've created that monster by giving out antibiotics to people. So as far as treatment, fluids, um, make sure you can drink stuff before you eat things, then um, rest, and probiotics are actually quite beneficial. There's some mixed results or specific studies were done that said you should use this ki certain kinds, but in general, they'll shorten diarrhea by one to two days and uh, improve stools after about a day. So I actually really like, I mentioned really liking probiotics. I think those are a huge benefit if um, someone's having loose stools. There's a bad taste to um, opening up a little packet and putting it in milk for a kid or something. So if someone's got a kind of queasy stomach or they're vomiting, it's maybe not the best treatment. But they're safe in children as well. There's some children's versions sold or I just tell people to go get one of the brands I recommend it, open up the little capsule, pour about a third or a half in for their kid, mix it in with some kind of liquid, have them drink that, and save the other half and use it again. And then they're very safe, so only rarely have we seen if somebody is really severely immune compromised that they could cause harm, but otherwise we have bacteria that live on our skin. These are things that are already in our intestines. They get wiped out when we're sick and we're just trying to put it back to make everything go back to normal. And uh, Imodium or peptobismol actually help slow down stools as well, but they should not be used if you have bloody stools because that could be something harmful. Just to uh, wrap up, uh, wash your hands, cover coughs and sneezes, rest, uh, be healthy, so eat healthy foods, uh, exercise in moderation on a regular basis, and then a lot of people come in, we've, I think we've really gotten the message out there that antibiotics don't really help, um, sometimes they're actually harmful, and there's a lot of treatments that you can do that are available over the counter. So, thanks everybody.